honored to be able to share with you about an approach to treatment that we've had in development for now over 20 years. This approach is different from all other approaches really to stuttering treatment because we don't attempt to try to reduce stuttering or increase fluency. Rather, we encourage children, teens, and adults to learn how to stutter openly, ensuring that their lives are never defined by the fluency of their speech. And in doing so, they are able to dream, speak, live. Now, this approach is unique in the sense that it's not informed to any degree by a textbook. It's, it's fully informed by the lived experiences of the thousands of people who stutter that I've had the honor to serve over the last 25 years. Starting with one young man who um, I met when I was an undergraduate. And, you know, I'm actually ashamed to share with you that this young man stuttered significantly and every session that I had with him, I worked to try to help him to no longer stutter. And he practiced as hard as he could. And he could be fluent within that sterile clinical environment. But every time he would go home or go into the classroom or go to play sports, the stuttering was there. Um, and he would come back and ask me, what was he doing wrong? And the only response that I could give to him was, you need to practice more. And then when he said, I'm practicing more and it's still not working, then I said to him, well, maybe you're not ready for therapy. Um, because as a teenager, you may not be motivated, you need to come back. Um, and then when you're ready, you'll be able to achieve this. I knew at the time in my head and my heart that that wasn't the right approach, but I had no other skill set, no other knowledge, and so I left him sitting with the idea that he was essentially a failure and that it was on him that he wasn't able to speak fluently. This young man was trying to tell me what many other children and adults have told me for many years now, and that is that if someone tells me I'm not to stutter, and they're basically telling me not to talk I, because when I talk, I stutter. But imagine you live your life as a person who stutters. And from a young age, everyone tells you, stop, start over, try again. You, you can take a deep breath and maybe you'll be able to talk more fluently. Why don't you practice some more? You know, maybe, maybe um, there's some sort of medication you can take. Um, maybe we need to seek some more support. And then over time, internally and externally, you're being told that you are not good at communicating. Um, and all of this leads to the development of what, we, of what we refer to as the iceberg of stuttering. Meaning that you start out not understanding that you talk differently, and then over time, your own internal and external reactions to that difference and the pressure to conform to fluency leads to this development of the iceberg of stuttering, meaning that the stuttering is just the tip of the iceberg and all your thoughts, feelings, reactions, and beliefs that are connected to the negative experiences of stuttering are all underneath the surface. Let's hear this in action with, an, with a participant that we have who describes that, the negative thoughts that have developed over time. What are some of the thoughts that you think are going through your mind? What are you saying to yourself? Um, not very nice things. <laughs> it's like, um, why can't you do it? Like they're gonna think bad about you. Um, you were fine earlier, you, you can say it now. Like, um, I wish this wasn't happening or like they're, uh, looking at me funny. Um, I wish I could be normal. <laughs> um, um, I want this conversation to end like right here, right now, or like I just want not to be here. Um, I should be better at this by now. Okay, not one positive thought. And that's developed over time. Keep Genesis in mind. We're gonna come back to her at the end of the talk when you see the outcome of her going through the care model. Now look at young Steven. His iceberg hasn't developed yet, and look what he's learning at a very young age. What I learned from my group is if you stutter, don't give up, just keep on trying, and don't let stutter stop you from being who you are. Now we're going to come back to Stephen so that you can see the impact of Stephen over time and 
preventing that iceberg from developing through building communication, advocacy, resiliency, and education. So let's start with communication. What we know about people who stutter, and if you, if you stutter yourself or you have a child who stutters, you enter into kindergarten, and, and what is the first thing you want to do? You want to protect your child from having, having a ne negative experience of stuttering. And so do the teachers, and so do the speech-language pathologists. So intuitively, what do we do? We say, listen, Sally doesn't have to talk in class. We're not going to call on her. She doesn't have to give presentations. And in doing so, year after year after year, that child doesn't have the same opportunity to develop their pragmatic skills. Because how we define communication is that you have to be fluent in order to communicate effectively. Through the CARE model, what we show is that fluency has nothing to do with effective communication. In fact, we've proven that people can still stutter on every word and be able to be among the most effective communicators. Let's watch Kamara. Good evening, Atlanta. <laughs> My name is Kamar, and I am eight years old. I am a person who stutters. Today, I am sharing about stuttering. Fact one, people who stutter should not be ashamed. Fact two, people who stutter should keep speaking no matter what. Fact three, people, we are all good communicators. We have strong, tall bodies and strong voices. Fact four, I want to be a singer because I like to sing. Stuttering cannot stop me, so we're teaching them that at a very young age. If we go on to advocacy, that's the second part of the model. Everything is overlapping, but what we need to understand is that people who stutter in instinctively will apologize for their stuttering. You didn't hear that in Kimora's speech, and you didn't hear it in Stephen either, because they're learning at a, not a young age not to do that. But for many older school-aged children and adults, if you ask them about their stuttering or if they share about it, they will say to you, I'm sorry, uh, you know, I stutter, please bear with me. Um, it may take me, um, you know, I, I, I know I'm gonna take more time than you need me to take and I, and I apologize for that. And our research shows that in that apology, it confirms what is the stuttering stereotype. Many of you may think that stuttering is psychological and that people stutter because they're nervous, shy, or anxious, but stuttering is neurophysiological. We also see that there's evidence to suggest that there's a genetic transmission of stuttering. Why does that matter? It matters because when someone who stutters apologizes to you for their, for their stuttering, then you view them as nervous, anxious, shy, not capable of doing jobs that require significant communication. But when they learn how to talk to you about their stuttering in a way that's empowering, you see them totally differently. It deconfirms the stuttering stereotype, just like Albert. I'm Albert, uh, I'm a student here at UT, um, and I'm also a person who stutters, which means that it may take me longer to say what I need to say, but nonetheless, I will say it. No apology there. You can't take, you can't take stuttering and apply any stereotype to Albert, and that's what we're instilling in young children through adults. The next thing that we have to focus on is resiliency. Stuttering is hard. It will be hard. You will face discrimination. You will have people judge you, think differently of you, and you have to build your resiliency from within so that you don't let it impact you. And you have to build it up strong enough so that you will seek out communicative exchanges that are challenging instead of avoiding it. And what we see often is that teens and adults they will live most of their high school life in the bathroom during lunch because they don't want to interact. Adults will even contemplate suicide because of the pressure to conform. And what we want to let them know at an early age is you can do this. You can do it even better than other people and you will succeed. Let's watch Nadia. Hello, my name is Nadia Watson and I'm eight years old. And what I wish the world knew about stuttering is it's actually a very unique thing that, that, that people do. And if, pe and if someone thinks like there's something wrong with you, well, <laughs> they're thinking wrong. Hey, there you go. And nobody can take that away from her either. The next piece is education. There's so much misinformation about stuttering, um, and there's no way for me to cover it all in this talk. But let me say to you again, stuttering is not psychological. If you've watched The King's Speech, it's one of the most popular movies about stuttering. The only thing that's positive about it is that he is obviously brilliant. 
He is in a leadership position, but it suggests to you that if you practice hard enough, you can be fluent, and that's a common fallacy. One of the other things that I want you to know if you're a parent is that there's nothing that you have done or can do that's going to cause your child to stutter, but there's everything that you can do to actually help your child to feel positive about their communication and to know that stuttering is not going to stop them from living their lives to the fullest. In the case of children that stutter, they want to see their parents to to tell them that it's okay to stutter. And it's just one of the things that makes people different. Actions may be strong, because then words they say, but change always starts with words. You have to be explicit in telling them that you love them and you love the way they speak. Just don't assume they know. I say this from personal experience because I wish my dad had said this aloud to me. In my head, I always assumed that he was ashamed of me, but I never really knew what he thought. I never asked and he never told me. Well, now it's too late. Uh, My dad has Alzheimer's and in a few years, he may not even know who I am much less tell me my stutter wasn't a big deal. So parents, uh, just don't put put it off for later or for in the future when your kids grow up. Just tell your kids right now. Now, let's go back to Stephen who went through our care model and listen to the impact on him years later. After going to the camp, I didn't really think about stuttering anymore as something that could be troublesome or a hindrance to me. And so I just went on with my life, not thinking about it, just talking regularly like I do. If I stutter in my sentences, I do, but I don't really care. As he says, if I stutter, I do. I don't really care. It's just the way that I talk, effectively preventing that iceberg. And now let's watch Genesis melting the iceberg. Hello, my name is Genesis Cedillo and I'm a person who stutters. You will hear me stutter during the speech and that is okay. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me afterwards and I'd be more than happy to answer them. If you had told me a year ago I'd be standing in front of a room full of people talking about stuttering, I would have never believed you. Someone would mention the, the word stutter and Someone would mention the word stutter and I would collapse into a puddle of tears. I was always taught that my stutter was taboo and should never be discussed. This resulted in me hiding my stutter from the entire world. I was telling myself that my natural voice was not good enough to be showcased. And then I started this program at the Blank Center. In just 10 short weeks, my entire perspective on stuttering has has changed. I was... I was once terrified of my own voice and trapped inside the bubble of, I need to be fixed. However, I have learned that my stutter is not the problem. People's ignorance and opinion on stuttering is the true problem. I cannot control how people will react to my stutter. I can only control how I feel and advocate for my stutter. With this in mind, I challenged my, myself to be my biggest stuttering cheerleader. I found, I found myself advocating for stuttering left and right, from, from, from sharing posts on Instagram to disclosing to to my entire class during a presentation. I felt powerful, seen, and for the very first time in control of my stutter. Stuttering stuttering once had me in shackles and now I am wearing it like a crown. So as you can see with, thank you. Finally, I, I will just say that if you know of someone who stutters, you know of a parent, a friend, or a loved one, and they're struggling to stop stuttering, please let them know there's another way. Stuttering is the way that they talk, and there's a path where they can accept that. Not only accept that, but they can learn how to communicate effectively, stutter openly, advocate meaningfully. Essentially, they can learn how to... Dream, speak, love. Dream, speak, live. But... In French, that is Reve Vale on Direct. On Long Telem H. Sonyan Abran Bibis. Tachlon Daber Tichia. Dream, speak, live. Sapne deko, bolo, jiro. Mong, shuo, jiju. 
Droom, spreek, leef. Dream, speak, live.